good morning and good afternoon to all. My name is Vesi Haralampieva. I'm a senior counsel at the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. It is my great pleasure to welcome you all today to our webinar, Climate Change and Courts. Before we start, a few house, uh, housekeeping notes from me. First, please choose your preferred language channel. You will see you have the options of English, Russian, and Khmer languages. The webinar will be recorded. We will exclude the discussions, however, from any publicly available material uh, after the webinar. And please uh, send us our questions through the Q&A box throughout the session. And we look forward to uh, hearing from you and uh, addressing your questions at the end of each session. So this webinar is organized jointly with our colleagues from the Asian Development Bank, the Global Judicial Institute of the Environment, and the European Union Forum of Judges for the Environment. I would like to thank them all for their collaboration and partnership. We join forces for this event because there is a growing demand among the judicial community for shared knowledge and information about how national courts adjudicate on matters relating to climate change. But also, what is the impact of court judgments on national policy making and corporate climate action in the context of the international climate goals and national commitments? We have seen a rising global wave of climate litigation and historic rulings handed down in the Netherlands, in Australia, Poland, and other countries that underline the role of courts as a forum for progressing climate justice, a forum that holds companies and governments to account for their responsibilities to address climate change. While in the past climate litigation was thought largely a phenomenon in the global north, over the last years, we have seen an increased number of cases in the developing countries and emerging economies. But there are challenges. And these challenges are largely due to the complex nature of climate change, as climate change gives rise to disputes that are not easily addressed by existing legal doctrines and frameworks. The assessment of future climate impacts deals with uncertainty. It requires bringing in the latest scientific knowledge, but also taking into account the complex political and social economic context in order to address matters relating to equity and justice. So climate change is a legal disruptor as it has led to the creation of a number of new legal regimes and frameworks. But at the same time, it's disruptive also of the court of the adjudicative processes because traditional judicial tools and procedure may not be sufficient for upholding the rule of law. So with this, I would like to hand over to my co-host, Ms. Christina Pack from the Asian Development Bank for her welcoming words and introduction of our keynote speakers. Thank you and enjoy this webinar. Thanks so much, Fessy. Uh, a warm hello, everyone, and thank you all for being here today. Um, in particular, our chief justices and judges uh, who have tuned in from all regions around the world, including South Asia, Southeast Asia, South Pacific, Central West, and Europe. And so as we approach COP26, it's timely to convene all of you to highlight the vital role of the courts and judges play in addressing climate change. Today's event um, is an exciting opportunity to collaborate with EBRD, the Global Judicial Institute on the Environment, EU Forum for the Judges, as well as with the lead leading experts who are presenting today to leverage our collective knowledge and resources to ensure that judges will be ready when climate cases arrive in their courtrooms. We will now move to our wonderful speakers. It is my privilege to introduce the Honorable Justice Benjamin from the National High Court of Brazil. He is, a lead, he is also a lead founder of the Global Judicial Institute on the Environment. Justice Benjamin has been a big advocate for judicial education and has been contributing to ADB's judicial capacity building program since the beginning in 2010. My favorite Justice Benjamin quote is, if judges are in charge of deciding all sorts of conflicts about life, death, love, human rights, and national security, it makes no sense to leave climate change outside the courtroom. Justice Benjamin. Many thanks, a good day to everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here today with uh, you, 
I would like to thank the ADB General Counsel, uh, Thomas Clark, and if, if he allows me to also thank his predecessor, Chris Stevens, because this is an ongoing um, project, a global project, it's not just Asian project that ADB has. It's designed for Asia and the Pacific, but it has reached the whole planet. And also uh, my colleague, uh, the general counsel of the European uh, Bank for um, um, Reconstruction and Development, um, Michael Strauss that I'm meeting here for the first time. Congratulations for your work. Congratulations for the outstanding team that you have with you. We are all together here for uh, discussing climate change and not just climate change in the courtroom, climate change law in general. It's important for judges to build their capacity in all areas of law, but even more in those fields of law that are still developing what we could call cutting edge uh, legal issues that, that we judges are either beginning to face or will be facing in the near uh, future. Let me say a few words about the Global Judicial Institute on the Environment. And as you can see in the program, we have three other outstanding colleagues, founding members of the Global Judicial Institute on the Environment. Uh, my colleague, Lord Robert Carnworth, uh, my colleague, Justice Luc Labrissen, and my colleague, um, uh, Justice Brian Preston from different parts uh, of the world. And I'm very grateful to all three and the many others that brought together in 2016, the Global Judicial Institute on the Environment which is organized under Swiss law, and it is registered in the Geneva Canton in Switzerland. And from its design phase to the implementation, we have uh, counted uh, on the support of the World Commission on Environmental Law, of IUCN and the president, the chair of WCI will be speaking in a minute. Uh, UNEP, the United Nations Environmental um, uh, Program and also the Asian uh, Development Bank. So uh, this is uh, an initiative of judges for judges and by judges, but we do uh, uh, have partners, important partners and I do hope that the European Bank can become a partner of the Global Judicial Institute on the Environment. Let me um, say uh, two more things. One, to remember that the ADB program is started only in 2010 with the Asian Judges Symposium. And when we consider Christina Pack and, and, and Vaselina Haram and Pieva, the impact and the achievements of this program, the impression is that it has been there forever as commercial law, for example. It's new, it's extraordinary in its uh, impact, but it's also something that can be done and should be done in other parts of the world. And that's why we are so happy to see here the European Bank. Let me uh, thank the two teams. They are fantastic. Christina Pack and Vaselina um, um, Harampieva. You have two fantastic teams. And as a citizen of the world, um, of the planet, let me use uh, this, this few seconds to thank this collective endeavor that you uh, lead. Um, my last point is about us judges. I would like to welcome the many judges that are joining for the first time. And remember that we judges 
are creatures that are not afraid of legal complexities. And here we have one of the most difficult, complex legal issues in the history of we judges. And we are quite old, so to speak, as institutions. If you, if you look at the most ancient texts from the Hammurabi Code to the Manu Code, you are going to see us, not Antonio Benjamin, not the colleagues that are here, but judges named as such. In the, in the, in, in the field of climate change, we face issues that other most relevant topics in our profession pale in, in relevance. Think of war crimes, major violations of human rights, and everything else that matters to people. Nothing is of the nature and nothing is of the relevance of climate change, because climate change has um, the possibility, and we hope it's a possibility that will not happen to destroy the foundations of life. And we judges are the keepers of life. We are not the keepers of the status quo. In fact, it's quite the opposite. We judges are there to change the status quo when the status quo is against life is against freedom, it is against um, justice. So welcome to, uh, to all of you, many thanks to the, to the teams, uh, my colleague Luc Lavrissin, we had so many meetings and, and work in preparing for this event. And I'm sure just looking at the program that we are going to have a first, but still a fantastic opportunity to share knowledge and to learn together. Thank you. Thank you, Justice Benjamin. Um, thank you for um, reminding us of the gravity of, of the problem and, and the responsibilities that judges have. Um, next, um, I'm immensely proud to introduce um, ADB's general counsel, Thomas Clark. He's been an absolute champion of our judicial technical assistance program since joining ADB about a year ago. Tom helped expand our judicial capacity building program. Um, as well as ADB's law and policy reform program, recognizing its value in supporting inclusive and sustainable development. He's a globally recognized thought leader with extensive experience with governments and private sector. And he's a tremendous asset to ADB and our client countries. So Tom. Well, thank you very much for those uh, warm and I'm afraid undeserved uh, words, Christina, but uh, what really deserves the thanks are all of the participants and organizers of the event uh, today. And it's my distinct pleasure and honor to, uh, to welcome and, and thank uh, the many honorable chief justices and judges, particularly honorable justice Antonio Benjamin for your very, very warm uh, words just now. Uh, honorable justice Luke Liverson, uh, my good friend, uh, EBRD General Counsel, uh, Michael Strauss, distinguished speakers, respected guests and friends, all of you warm and uh, very cordial greetings from Manila. For ADB, uh, this event is particularly momentous. It represents new beginnings and new relationships. This webinar introduces ADB's law and policy reform program to judges across Central and West Asia. With this webinar, we welcome judges from Central and West Asia and ADB's extensive network of judges across the Asia and Pacific, the Asia and Pacific Judicial Network on the Environment. This webinar also provides us with an opportunity to collaborate with old and new partners. We're delighted to work again with the Global Judicial Institute on the Environment and very excited to collaborate with the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development and the European Union Forum of Judges for the Environment. We have come together for this webinar precisely because we recognize, as Justice Benjamin was saying, that climate and environmental litigation is increasingly global, a reflection of the challenges that we are all facing collectively. These disputes are technical and they raise complex legal issues, 
Resolving them therefore requires dedicated expertise, skill, and an awareness of local environmental issues and climate change impacts. As the Lahore High Court observed in the 2016 decision, Lakhari versus Federation of Pakistan, climate change can present in a broad range of disputes, such as agriculture, health, food, migration, disaster preparedness, or even seemingly mundane things like approvals for buildings and infrastructure. Delivering environmental and climate justice, therefore, requires that a judge have the capacity to understand how the matter is relevant to national climate action or biodiversity protection. Legal and policy frameworks also shape the nature of these legal disputes. Each of ADB's developing member countries in Central and West Asia is a party to the Paris Agreement and the Convention on Biological Diversity. In line with their treaty commitments, governments are establishing new policies and sector-specific laws. Sectoral regulation of climate change means that climate litigation is more likely to occur as a dispute related to a sector under, for example, an energy or a water law. Across Asia and the Pacific, judges must grapple with balancing economic development and environmental protection. And ADB understands that judges need opportunities to come together and exchange ideas and thoughts on best practices. So that is why we invest in bringing judges together under the Asia and Pacific Judicial Network on Environment or AJNE. AJNE is a community of judges dedicated to furthering justice by upholding the rule of law to support national and regional sustainable development. Right now, judges have tuned in from across Asia and the Pacific. They welcome the expansion of this judicial community, the chance to forge new relationships with judges from Central and West Asia, and the opportunity to hear from our distinguished panel of speakers. Our ADB Office of the General Counsel's Law and Policy Reform Program, which Christina has led very ably, has worked with judges for over 10 years. And so Justice Benjamin, you are quite right and kind to warmly thank my dear predecessor, Chris Stevens. I greatly appreciate your, your comments. We have supported judiciaries to establish green benches and develop special rules of procedure. Our LPR program has also delivered tailored capacity building programs and convened regional knowledge sharing conferences. We've been privileged to play some small part in expanding the awareness of the developing legal environment around climate change law. As one major recent example, in December of last year, ADB published a four-part report series called Climate Change, Coming Soon to a Court Near You. We kind of like the dramatic titles on these things. And it contains a comprehensive review of the growing number and variety of climate lawsuits in the Asia and the Pacific region. It also emphasizes some of the unique flavor and voice of Asian jurisprudence and compares it with global approaches. It is being translated into multiple languages. The report series was a joint effort with the Sabin Center for Climate Change Law and a team of researchers and authors who gathered cases from 32 countries covered in the report series. And this included ADB's very own Cecile Sakango and Brioni Ailes, who I'm very happy to say will be speaking about it on one of the panels in a little while. We have recently launched a new regional technical assistance to provide sustained support to judiciaries in the adjudication of environmental and climate change disputes, along with commercial law disputes. Initiatives under this technical assistance program will include tailored capacity building programs and specialized knowledge resources. Ladies and gentlemen, the coming years fall within the decade of action. Climate change and environmental lawsuits will become increasingly common for judges. Judiciaries can respond to this change by building technical capacity within their ranks and creating processes that enable efficient, effective, and fair resolution of climate and environmental disputes. Such preparation will allow judges to uphold the rule of law, thereby supporting the legislative and policy intent of central governments and of the Sustainable Development Goals. ADB looks forward to continuing our partnership with the Supreme Courts and judicial learning bodies across Central West Asia, South Asia, Southeast Asia, and the Pacific in collaboration with our partners. 
I thank all of you for your attendance and attention here, for our many guests and contributors, and wish the entire symposium the best of luck as we advance together on this incredibly critical topic. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much. So, um, it is my pleasure and honor to introduce now uh, the EBRD's general counsel, Mr. Michael Strauss. Mike is a stout supporter of the work of the Legal Transition Program of the EBRD's Office of the General Counsel that aims to promote stable, predictable, and transparent legal frameworks in the EBRD's countries of operations for promoting sustainable economic development. Mike's role is key for advancing the ambitious green agenda of the bank, and he is person personally passionate about promoting environmental and climate justice. Before EBRD, Mike served on the board of the Asian Development Bank for five years, serving as the US alternate executive director and then as acting executive director. Mike has extensive commercial and development market experience. He has worked in IMF and the World Bank Group and in private practice in the US in Europe. Mike, over to you. Thank you, Bessie, and uh, I'll answer the phone over there in a second, but uh, <laughs> thank you for the very kind words, and also to my friend uh, ADB General Counsel Tom Clark and to the Honorable Justice Benjamin for your remarks. You're both very, very hard acts to follow, to say the least. Good morning, Honorable Judges, ladies and gentlemen. It's really a pleasure to welcome you today on behalf of the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development to our joint webinar on climate change and courts. I'd like to offer special thanks to my old colleagues and friends from ADB, especially Christina, who's used to having to suffer through my singing rather than my speaking, um, but uh, also to the, the Global Justice Institute on the Environment and the EU Forum of Judges for the Environment for their collaboration and efforts in organizing today's great event. It's an honor to welcome such a distinguished group of speakers, to say the least. Sustainable development and environmentally sound investing lie at the heart of the EBRD's mandate. The EBRD walks the walk on these commitments by applying its environmental and social policy in each project. Indeed, the EBRD is strengthening its position as a leader in green finance with an ambitious plan to become a majority green bank by 2025. To be more specific, we've defined green as a key component of the transition to sustainable markets and work with private and public partners to build low carbon and resilient economies. The EBRD's promotion of green and sustainable economic development is in line with the international climate change agreements, but it also takes into account broader environmental objectives such as biodiversity, pollution, and social and governance issues. Climate change and environmental deg degradation are, are the most urgent, and I don't think it's an exaggeration to say truly existential challenge, challenges of our time. And much like ADB, although I think in very different ways, Many of the EBRD's countries of operations are particularly vulnerable to climate change. We've seen the devastating impacts of the wildfires in Turkey, Greece, and Bulgaria this summer, as well as flooding in Central Europe and droughts in Central Asia and North Africa. At the same time, the market transition to low carbon and resilient economies affects fossil fuel dependent businesses, communities, and livelihoods. So, yet we tend to think of climate change and the law as a matter mainly of regulation, but it's also a subject that connects to justice. The impacts of climate change are pervasive and raise many scientific, political, economic, and financial questions, as well as questions about equity and responsibility. It shouldn't surprise us, therefore, and it connects directly with Justice to Benjamin's wonderful quote uh, that Christina offered, that courts and judges in our countries of operations are increasingly ruling in cases related to climate change and the environment. The accelerating volatility of climate change and its wide impacts on society are really transforming the traditional principles of environmental law, but also tort and public health. Can the law provide a bridge between scientific knowledge, policymaking, and equity, as increasingly people turn to the courts to seek justice in climate-related matters? Starting from first principles on that question, on the delivery of and access to justice, EBRD's legal transition program has worked for many years on judicial capacity building activities providing ju judges in our countries of operations with the tools they need to adjudicate complex commercial matters. The LTP's training programs have traditionally covered areas of commercial law, most relevant for local and foreign investment. The program has successfully focused on filling gaps in judicial training and has developed products and tools for judges in areas where questions of law, economics, and finance all intersect. 
this has prepared LTP, I think, and the BRD more widely, very, very well to lead in the emerging field of climate and justice. Our experience with the LTP has shown that the most effective way to support national legal systems and enforcement is through judicial education, training, and information sharing. Contributing to the development of an international judicial community around environmental law and climate change provides, provides judges with the necessary tools to adjudicate complex issues. Crucially, it will be also of immense value to those giving legal force to the Paris commitments from lawmakers or legal practitioners more widely. We're, we're very much looking forward to working with our partners here to just, and others elsewhere to support the judiciary and the broader legal profession in responding to climate change by adapting traditional legal instruments and applying them in novel and thoughtful ways to address the greatest challenge of this century. Today, as others have mentioned, we'll hear from eminent judges, climate change experts, and academics about both climate litigation trends in the global north, but also the gradual rise of climate justice in emerging markets and developing economies. I look forward to a fruitful set of discussions about the role of courts in shaping climate mitigation and adaptation policies to meet the Paris Agreement objectives as a driver for climate action. With this in mind, let's launch what we expect to be a very interesting and successful webinar. I'll turn it back over to you, Vessi and Christina, uh, to introduce the first panel, and thank you very much. Thanks to our wonderful opening speakers. Uh, so we'll now move on to the technical sessions. So for our first session, we have four eminent speakers, Professor Christina Voigt, Joanna mm -hmm. Setzer, and ADB's very own Brian e. Eels and Cecilia Conco. So they will bring you around the world to provide an overview of climate litigation trends in both civil law and common law legal system. Who brought the action against what type of party based on what claim and legal basis and how the court decided. Um, so here's uh, Professor Christina Voigt. She's a globally uh, recognized climate legal um, expert and she's also the recently elected chair of the IUCN World Commission on Environmental Law. Welcome Professor Voigt. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christina, um, for your kind welcome. Um, thank you also for organizing this very important uh, webinar on that uh, topic that, that couldn't be more timely and relevant. And I would also like to commend the previous uh, speakers for their uh, absolutely crucial remarks. And I would just like to jump into my presentation. I hope it's somewhere online. I could also share my screen. Um, if that is technically possible, I, I share my screen then. Yes, please go ahead. Okay, no problem. Um, I will try to address the question of whether judges can save the world and share some perspective on climate change litigation. But of course, to answer uh, upfront, of course, judges cannot save the world, but as uh, Thomas Clark mentioned in his intervention, the coming years, and we're talking about this decade until the end of 2030, until the end of this decade, um, the, the coming years uh, will bring uh, to a significant uh, judicial activism on climate change. And here, judges will have to play a, an important part of the overall picture um, in, in terms of contributing to providing solution to that overall challenge of climate change in providing efficient, effective, fair, and just resolutions. Uh, what I would like to do is to very briefly say wh where we are in terms of climate change, what needs to be done, what is the scientific background, before I briefly mention some of the reports, one report by the ADB was already mentioned, um, but I'll, I'll provide some other databases and links so that the interested audience can, can go there and find some more information. I'll very briefly provide some case examples, although I, I assume that Joanna Setzer, who's going to speak later, will also go into some more detail on, on recent cases. And then I wrap up with some final observations. But where do we need to go? We already heard several speakers alluding, of course, to the Paris Agreement, which is not only a legally binding international treaty on its 191 parties, it's almost universal, but it's also kind of a global social contract, 
about where the world needs to go and what the world needs to avoid uh, in terms of climate change. And here in Article 2, we have that overall temperature goal of avoiding that global temperature uh, exceed or uh, uh, trying to uh, achieve that it stays well below two degrees centigrade or even stay at 1.5 degrees. Now, these numbers don't tell us very much of what exactly needs to be done. And therefore, it's important to remind ourselves that the agreement itself is based on best available science. It's built into the agreement, which means that at any point in time, it has to be interpreted in light of the best available science. And that is currently provided by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC. And as many of you know, the IPCC is currently working on its sixth assessment report and the first part of it was just released about two months ago and if we have a look at what exactly the um, IPCC indicates it says there from the five scenarios in which the IPCC looks there really only is one scenario that may assure with a high degree of certainty that the world is not warming up to two degrees and that one scenario, and I include it here on the next slide, it's the, the, the lowest one, the high blue one, the light blue line on the very bottom. This scenario indicates that we have to get greenhouse gas emissions reduced drastically and immediately so as to achieve carbon neutrality around 2050. That's when the green, the light blue line crosses the, the zero line, and they have to stay negative thereafter until the end of the century. And this really involves an overall transformative change of all sectors of everything we do, uh, including also the legal system. Now, second to the reports that I mentioned from the outset, there are several reports that just came out recently that give a very, uh, very good and detailed background on the overall landscape on climate litigation as we see it uh, unfolding um, in front of our eyes. There was a report by the Geneva Association from April this year on global climate litigation and insights in the evolving global landscape. We have the report from the Asian Developing Bank that was already mentioned by Mr. Clark, which came out about a year ago on climate change coming soon to a court near you. But also the United Nations Environment Program is uh, um, regularly providing an update on climate change litigation and our last status report was from 2020. I included links here. My presentation can be disseminated to the um, um, participants and, and you can check these reports if you're interested. Another very important aspect are global databases where you actually can find these cases and the judgments themselves for interested judges or uh, uh, activists or uh, lawyers, advocates to check. There's one maintained by the Seven Center for Climate Law at the University, uh, Columbia University in New York. And the other one is by the Grantham Research Institute on Climate and the Environment. I'm sure uh, Joanna is gonna speak about it, the London School of Economics. I think these um, databases are crucially important tools also for judges because they can actually look at what other courts decided, how they decided, what kind of arguments were put forward, which ones were rejected, which ones were successful, and it's, it's a tool of immediate uh, accessibility. Now, what we're seeing currently um, is a global uh, trend in increasing numbers of climate-related uh, cases. There's, of course, a, a huge number in the United States, but also worldwide. That's the um, the other the the orange uh, part of the um, the overview here, where we see increasing numbers. This is a graph provided um, from uh, the Seven Center on Climate Law and the Geneva Center. Uh, so you see that there is uh, currently a trend which just seems to continue upward, uh, where we see more and more cases coming to the courts. What are these cases about? So there are many different aspects related to climate change, and we already heard some um, because climate change is such a complex issue. It goes into every single sector um, of the economy. Much that humans do is in one way or the other related to climate change. 
but it's also not just climate change mitigation, there's also cases that concern adaptation of how we relate to the consequences of climate change impacts. And these cases can primarily be put in two different boxes. I'm sure there are other boxes as well, but one is uh, cases or suits against governments. This is again an overview from the Seven Center for Climate Law in New York. And the other one is cases against um, corporations against uh, private actors. But even if you look at the cases or the suits against governments, you see a whole host of different um, uh, uh, claims based on different uh, legal concepts that are being put forward. Uh, some deal with uh, participation rights, public assembly, um, access to information, liberty rights, rights to uh, access to justice. Um, there are other cases that deal with more substantive um, obligations in terms of actually greenhouse gas emission reductions, uh, or um, we have human rights cases, both domestic and now a couple of international cases, but there are also various other cases that deal with more procedural rights, for example, what kind of climate effects have to be taken into account when environmental um, impact assessments are carried out. I just wanted to show you this whole range of different cases just to get an idea of what climate change litigation is because there are many different things. And the same uh, or similar is the uh, situation with regard to corporations where some of the cases deal with actual emission greenhouse gas emission reductions, but we also have cases that are concerned about misleading advertiser or the non-compliance with disclosure obligations or also procedural obligations in terms of carrying out environmental impact assessment or what kind of information has to be submitted prior to a licensing or permitting um, decision. Now, just very, very briefly, um, three case examples. I'm sure many of you know them already. I just chose three that are maybe the most um, impactful one here in Europe, but they have spread around the world. Very briefly, one of the core cases of, is uh, the case brought by the Agenda Foundation, which is an environmental NGO. Um, and this case was brought by the foundation together with 900 Dutch citizens against the state of the Netherlands. It's already a couple of years back that this case was launched in 2015, but it dealt with a claim that the state was requested to reduce its greenhouse gas emission um, uh, um, um, ambition by uh, 20 to 25 to 40% from what then was only 17%. And the case of the first instance, second instance, and the Supreme Court of the Netherlands went with the claimants and upheld that the state of the Netherlands uh, was obliged to uh, reduce its emission, um, uh, greenhouse gas emissions by 25% in 2020. Um, uh, 20. This whole case was based on an unwritten uh, general duty of care that we find in tort law in, in the Dutch legal system. It is um, not written, but it's a an, an, an legal construction which has been used to draw in um, other social contracts and into, into give meaning to the terms of what the duty of care is, in this case, of the state of the Netherlands. And in its interpretation, um, the legal system, starting from the uh, Dutch civil court, um, in The Hague, they drew in both um, uh, human rights law, but also no harm principle, precautionary principle, and later on the Paris Agreement, into giving meaning to the terms uh, or giving meaning to the concept of duty of care. Briefly, the second case, same court, uh, court of first instance in the Hague District Court in the Netherlands, earlier this year decided a case that was brought by a, an NGO called Vereniging Milieu Defensie against Royal Dutch Shell. And here the claim again was that a corporation, Royal Dutch Shell, was required to reduce its emissions by 45% in 2030. And again, the legal basis is exactly the same norm, the unwritten duty of care in, Dutch, uh, in the Dutch civil code or Dutch uh, uh, tort law. And again, that particular court held or upheld the claim put forward by the plaintiffs and found that Royal Dutch Shell 
is obliged to limit its uh, CO2 emissions to at least 45% by the end of 2030. And that applies to all its operation, to all its dependencies worldwide, and also to scope one, two, and three emissions, which is quite a significant finding. And in interpreting the duty of care, again, that uh, uh, Hague District Court drew in the Paris Agreement, signed by the IPCC, human rights law, and uh, unwritten, uh, uh, non-binding OECD principles on uh, uh, corporations and human rights. And finally, the German Federal Constitutional Court also this year uh, came up with a very important finding on how the uh, German Climate Protection uh, Act violates fundamental liberty rights of very young claimants that brought several constitutional claims against the German government. And the German Constitutional Court found that the Climate Protection Act, as it stood back then, violated those liberty rights of, of the young claimants because it allocated heavier burden of emission reductions to the timeframe after 2030 and 20, uh, to 2050 where carbon neutrality was achieved. And that heavier burden upon the now young claimants is a um, intertemporal discrimination of their rights under the German constitution. And as a result of that finding, the then German government uh, did make a, um, a significant uh, revision to the Climate Protection Act and anticipated carbon neutrality by five years to 2045, but also came up with more specific measures to be implemented in order to reach carbon neutrality between 2030 and 2050. Now, just to offer you to wrap up some final observations, I think what we see is that climate litigation, strategic climate litigation in the meaning that it has wider implications than just to the, um, to the issue of the case and the claimants in a particular, uh, or the parties into, in a particular dispute. This is a global phenomena which has started um, a couple of years ago and is really currently taking up speed all over the world. It is, partly supported by the emergence of these global databases that I highlighted at the beginning, where immediate access is possible to the findings of other courts and their reasoning and their arguments, which of course enables yet other courts which are faced with climate cases to uh, look at how other uh, courts decided what arguments they used. What we're seeing is that you know, judges and courts, they cannot reinvent the wheel and they cannot come up with completely new constellations and concepts. But in many cases, judges and courts are using novel um, established rules and principles in novel ways, taking into account the fundamental challenge that climate change poses to the legal system. And they're applying these established rules and principles like duty of care, or defining fair share or human rights, but an intertemporal way. They're using these established rules and principles in novel ways commensurate to the challenge of climate change. What we really haven't seen yet uh, is a uh, far use of the right to a clean and healthy environment. I only wrote R2E, that's my personal abbreviation. That's something that is perhaps still to come. We have many countries, more than 150, that have a right to a clean and healthy environment recognized in their national constitution. And I would assume that there is more adjudication based on this right just around the corner. Another um, area to come are more cases against corporations, against private actors, including banks uh, that we've already seen now in uh, Europe, where certain decisions to give loans, for example, to coal um, industries are questioned as to their leg legality um, under, under the Paris Agreement or under states' uh, um, uh, climate acts. We also see a very interesting phenomenon where we see the use of different cases across different jurisdictions, kind of cross fertilization uh, amongst judges and amongst courts uh, uh, crossing different borders and boundaries. 
And I think this is perhaps uh, due to these databases that are out there, but also growing uh, thanks to the growing network of uh, the judicial community uh, provided by the Global Judicial Institute of the Environment and other judicial um, uh, uh, communities like AJNE, which bring judges together and enable their exchange of experiences and views and lessons learned. I just wanted to find round out that also the IOC and World Commission on Environmental Law is working together with judges, together with the Global Judicial Institute of Environment on both looking at effective climate uh, uh, legislation as well as climate litigation and trying to engage in this global discourse on uh, climate law. I just want to wrap up with what I uh, like as a very um, nice sentence in the Asian Development Bank's uh, report on climate change coming to a court, uh, coming soon to a court near you, where it just gives this alertness to judges where we say, where they say, we say to judges, and it says in Asia and the Pacific, but I guess it applies to judges worldwide. We say to judges, uphold the law, protect rights, balance interests and rely on science. Be vigilant and watch for the day when climate change comes to your courtroom. Tomorrow will dawn and in it, our children must build their lives in the world that we create. Let them stand on the shoulders of those who advocate for integrity, justice and fairness. And I'd like to close with those words and thank the organizers one more time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Boyd, for your excellent presentation. Um, so now we'll move on to our next presenter, uh, Joanna Seltzer from the Grantham Research Institute. Joanna? Hello, hi, uh, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I want to thank again uh, the ADB and the EBRD for this invitation and congratulate you for the work that you're doing with judges uh, in this area and organizing this event, which brings together so many chief justices. Uh, that's really, really important initiative. So um, in my presentation today, I have two aims. Um, it's only 10 minutes and I will time myself not to lose track of time. Uh, so I want to do two things. First, I want to give a big picture of what is happening in terms of global trends in climate change litigation. And, and this is something that you can find in one more report, <laughs> a report that we publish at the Grantham Research Institute every year. And the last one was published in July. And then I want to focus on specific trends in climate change litigation that invokes human rights and that are brought before human rights bodies. And this is something that I wrote together with my colleague Annalisa Savarezi in a paper that really uh, examines these trends in rights-based climate litigation. And the link is also uh, at the end of my presentation. So I will share my screen with you. And, uh, and then we can begin. Good. So um, Christina Voigt very uh, helpfully already introduced these two databases. Uh, this is where you can find uh, on the Grantham one, all the laws and policies uh, that are climate related from all around the world. And we have over 2000 laws and policies with summaries and texts uh, to these laws and policies. And then of course we have the litigation uh, that has been brought around the world. So uh, at the Grantham, together with uh, our colleagues at Sabin, we maintain this database and we have uh, the litigation outside of US, whereas the Sabin Center has uh, also all the litigation in the US. So if you're not familiar with these databases, I, I do encourage you to use them. And also in case you find something that is missing or that is not updated, that is not quite right, it is a lot of work to maintain this and we have small teams. So we really uh, apologize for anything missing and we mostly welcome any uh, comment and uh, suggestion of uh, cases that we might uh, be able to include. So I say this and now I have to say, what do we include that? And what do we consider as climate change litigation? And, and that's a difficult question because if you um, understand climate change and the challenges around climate change, you also understand that any policy, any case 
could be a climate case. And that would be impossible to track, at least with our manual methods of collecting cases. So we have to do some methodological choices, and we have therefore to consider not all the cases that could eventually uh, be relevant, but those that explicitly raise uh, issues of law or fact regarding climate science or climate change adaptation or climate change mitigation. So this is the body of cases that we examine. And of course, um, Christina already introduced the, the strategic litigation, that litigation that tries to bring impacts that go beyond the case. So usually we'll see the, the, the strategic litigation that is brought against governments, against those heads of state that commit to uh, reducing emissions, that signed the you know, Paris Agreement and, and other international agreements, but then not necessarily are being consistent in their actions domestically, and a group of companies that is responsible for the majority of the emissions. But as Christina was saying, um, and, and Thomas Clark also uh, already mentioned, we know that climate change litigation is a much more diverse group of cases that can deal with the planning application of expansion of coal mines or deforestation, or even cases that are challenging the installation of wind turbines or the allocation of allowances within the EU ETS. So this is important to keep in mind, and I like to emphasize this, that yes, we have the strategic litigation that is trying to bring that change, but we also have a much larger broad uh, case, uh, group of cases that explicitly deals with climate but that is more concentrated on specific activities. So with that in mind, let me introduce you to some of the most relevant trends in climate mitigation, and I want to compare those with the, what's happening in specifically rights-based climate mitigation. So this is a, a, an interesting comparison. If you look at these two graphs, you can see that climate change litigation around the world started actually even before in the late 1980s, but especially since 2005, we have cases that we consider as cases of climate change litigation. Of course, these have increased significantly in the last years, particularly after the Paris Agreement. And uh, so before the Paris Agreement, we had around 800 cases in the world. Since the Paris Agreement, we had more than a thousand cases added there. But what is interesting is, is to compare that to this human rights and climate change litigation trend. So in 2018, two scholars, Jackie Pew and Harry Ozofsky, said we, that they were starting to see this rights turn in climate change litigation. They were looking at the Ligari case that has been already mentioned and Ugenda and a few cases that since 2015 started bringing that clear connection between protecting human rights and protecting the climate. So if you look at the second graph, you can see how really since 2015, uh, since 2018, we had uh, over two thirds of these uh, cases. And in the paper that I wrote with Annalisa, we identify in total around the world, 112 human rights and climate litigation cases. What's also interesting is to see the geographical distribution of these cases. So um, in the other graph, and Christina also mentioned, uh, you can see how climate change litigation generally is very concentrated in the US. The vast majority of cases is in the US, over 1,300, 500 cases in the US, and then Europe and some in the Asia Pacific with Latin America uh, starting to, to become more relevant in international cases. Compare that to rights-based climate litigation, and you can see how uh, this newer phenomena, this uh, more recent trend of br bringing the connection between human rights and climate change has been very strong in the Asia Pacific, in Europe, in international, it's much more balanced and even in Africa. So uh, it, it is important, I think, for judges, specifically in these regions, to see how um, the connection between human rights and climate change has become more important. Um, now, looking at who's bringing these cases and against who these cases are being brought. 
general crime litigation, there are many cases that are filed by companies. And you, you, you see these cases dealing with the planning uh, applications of coal mines, for example, and expansions. And, and they are challenging uh, re specific requirements made by environmental agencies, for instance. You have, of course, cases brought by individuals and NGOs. But when you look at human rights and climate change litigation, then really the majority of cases is brought by individuals and groups. It's the more uh, strategic litigation that we're talking about. And we also have some uh, few cases that are brought by subnational governments and indigenous peoples. Interestingly, the defendants in this type of litigation, the vast majority, and our analysis revealed that um, uh, that is targeting, targeting states. So we have most cases dealing with mitigation and targeting states, but we also have a small and more recent trend. Uh, we have identified 16 cases that are brought against corporations. And this is not surprising because traditionally uh, there is a limited use of human rights to protect uh, against corporations against corporates. So of course, this is not something so obvious, but we are seeing that increase. And Christina Voigt already mentioned the, the case against Shell, which is likely to open even more that door and uh, for us to see more of such cases. So in the two minutes that are left, I want to say um, uh, a few last um, points about the where this is leading to. So in terms of the outcomes, we do this analysis where we examine uh, what are the direct outcomes, so how courts are deciding on these cases. And so far, climate litigation outside of the US tends to be decided in a favorable way towards climate protection. That so far hasn't been uh, the case with the human rights, that still the majority of cases has been unsuccessful, but this is rapidly changing. And also, it's important to take into consideration that cases might have impacts beyond the court, even if they are unsuccessful. And we're seeing a lot of that with cases against corporations, in that you create a risk of litigation that is already considered by corporates and actors in the financial sector. So to finish up, um, I like to present this uh, big trend of climate litigation uh, with 2015 as a dividing uh, moment in litigation against governments with the agenda case that Christina already introduced. So um, since the agenda case, we, had, we did an analysis where we observed that there are 37 cases that have been filed all around the world, South Korea, Ireland, Germany, Belgium, um, that are trying exactly to use that strategic systemic approach of agenda in cases filed against governments to deal with their commitments but also uh, over 50 cases that are challenging specific acts, omissions, or authorizations to third party. Basically, cases that show that there is this inconsistency between what's being promised, what is in the law, what is in the science, and what is being done on the ground. And then finally, uh, the same similar type of two waves in climate litigation against corporations. And here, it's interesting to see how um, since 2015, we are observing first, a trend of using a business and human rights approach. So um, it, uh, this is uh, started in the Philippines and we are seeing in many other countries. Secondly, an increasing understanding that, uh, that there are financial impacts of climate change and that these are physical transition and also litigation risks. And these have to take, be taken into consideration by banks, by regulators and uh, a number of other financial actors. And finally, uh, a number of cases that are challenging corporate announcements, uh, the communications of co companies and how these might be often uh, considered as greenwashing or climate washing. So um, I finish here and I leave the links to the uh, latest Grantham Research Report published in July and also to the paper that has that Zoom on climate change litigations and uh, dealing with human rights. So thank you all for your attention, and I'm looking forward to the questions and answers. Thanks so much, Joanna. Really appreciate it. So now we move to our last set of speakers, Brian e. Eels and Cecile Sukonko from the ADB. Thanks. Hi, everyone. A big warm hello from Manila. So I'm Bryony, and Cecile and I are absolutely delighted to uh, add to this discussion with a brief 
talk about our climate law reports, but also about some climate, recent climate litigation in Asia and the Pacific. So as other speakers have very kindly mentioned, ADB published four reports late last year called Climate Change Coming Soon to a Court Near You, because it is. Um, so our reports recognize that people are turning to courts for relief from matters of life and death. Uh, and judges need resources to help them respond to this new trend, these new legal challenges. So with these reports, we really wanted to show what climate litigation looks like in Asia and the Pacific. It does have a slightly different flavor. But we also wanted to highlight some excellent judicial decisions that and remedies. And these are cases that we think might just be have lessons that lawyers and judges from around the world might be able to use. So report one, that's the, the yellow one there, uh, briefly discusses climate science. Now, we are not climate scientists, we don't pretend to be, but we also recognize that the IPCC reports are long and they're technical. So sometimes judges and lawyers need an accessible entry point with references that they can enable them to dig date later, late in time, later in time. The next report is report two, and this discusses climate litigation thematically. Next slide, thanks guys. So it discusses climate litigation thematically, and it looks at the typical kinds of lawsuits that we are more likely to see in Asia and the Pacific. But what we did is we worked with Sabin Center for Climate Change Law and had them write the sections in relation to global jurisprudential cases and trends. And so for each section, we juxtapose the Asia and Pacific approaches with the approaches from the rest of the world. Cecile, over to you to talk about the other reports. Thank you, Bryony, and hello, everyone. Report three provides a holistic synthesis of the climate legal and policy frameworks of 32 countries in Asia and the Pacific. National frameworks are important because they underpin international climate action. They are the backbone of the domestic response to the climate emergency. If there's anything we've learned in the last 10 years, it's that international climate law and national climate law have a mutually symbiotic and mutually reinforcing relationship. At the end of the day, we can only work within our own jurisdiction and within our own soil. So the massive cross-pollination or cross-fertilization across jurisdictions that Professor Voigt mentioned earlier is why we conducted a comparative constitutional analysis. So for example, uh, next slide, please. For example, um, here's a table of South Asian countries and climate relevant constitutional rights. The table answers three questions. First, are the identified fundamental rights explicitly in the constitution? Number two, in the affirmative, are they in the bill of rights and therefore self-executing? Or are they quote, merely in the statement of directive principles and state policies? Lastly, in the negative, have the courts nevertheless inferred these rights in their jurisprudence? Turning to report four, next slide please. Um, report four explores the nature of the Paris Agreement, its history, and the framework of international instruments and international legal principle, principles that support global and domestic climate action. We also look at multilateral environmental treaties, regional agreements, and rights-based instruments, and how these instruments impact climate litigation. I think that a value added of our report is that, is that we look at the procedural aspects as well and how to domesticate international legal norms into the domestic sphere. Report 4 walks us through this roadmap, this framework of how and when states are bound. For example, if a state of a dualist country has signed a treaty but has not yet ratified it, is there any state obligation? Are there other international norms outside of treaties and conventions that are applicable in the domestic sphere? These are the kinds of questions that report for answers. A good example of how international legal norms find their way into domestic litigation is the July 2021 case from the High Court Division of the Bangladesh Supreme Court. Briny will speak more in this case. Uh, Briny? Thanks, Cecile. So in this case, 
the Bangladesh Environmental Law Association sued the government of Bangladesh and various other parties in relation to illegal occupation and dumping of sand in agricultural land and wetlands, violating the Bangladesh Environment Economic Zone Act. And the court said that since Bangladesh is party to the Ramsar Convention, the government actually has a legal obligation to immediately formulate an, both a national policy, but also to pass a law to realize the objectives of the convention and protect Bangladesh's wetlands. So the court, a bit like in Uganda, the court didn't tell the government what should be in the law and policy, merely that these instruments were needed to ensure wetlands are protected. And in making the order, the court was very aware of the dire need to protect fresh water and ensure that it's available for human use and consumption for agriculture, but also for survival of animals. So there's this consideration of other species other than humans. But where the court gets really creative and interesting is in its orders uh, for the education ministry to run regular hour long tutorials to educate every student in Bangladesh on the importance and benefits of protecting Bangladesh's wetlands. And Bangladesh's law students, sorry, law schools and their judicial academy must also take note of the decision. Furthermore, the court required local governments to also engage in regular awareness raising activities about wetlands. And I think what this decision demonstrates is that the court was inherently unaware of the vital role that education plays in protecting our ecosystems and climate. So it's an example of that awareness and creativity. Another example of judicial innovation in Asia is the recent decision of the Pakistan Supreme Court in the matter of DG Khan cement versus the government of Punjab. And Cecile will talk further about it. Thanks, Bryony. Uh, DG Khan Company versus Punjab was written by one of the globe's leading lights in climate change jurisprudence, Justice Mansur Ali Shah, whom I believe is with us today. So a very special welcome and good afternoon to Justice Shah. Um, in DG Khan versus Punjab, the Supreme Court of Pakistan upheld the decision of the government to ban the construction or expansion of cement plants in environmentally fragile zones. A cement company had challenged this decision as allegedly being violative of their constitutional right to freedom of trade, business, and profession. The Supreme Court disagreed and said that allowing cement plants could further deplete groundwater resources and cause other harmful environmental impacts. This case is a really good example of a court deciding a case with a quote, climate lens. While climate change was not directly pleaded by the parties, the court underscored that climate change should be considered in government decisions. In addition, the court emphasized the need to take into account intergenerational justice in climate cases and introduced the concept of quote, climate democracies. So this, quote, so this case is interesting in that it shows us what the next turn of climate litigation would possibly look like. How is the right of participation operationalized? What does this right include and require? I believe we see the beginnings of an answer in a Papua New Guinea case, which was released just last month, just last September, which Bryony will discuss. Um, Bryony? Yeah, thank you. So this is a procedural case from the Supreme Court of Papua New Guinea, and it's looking at a minister's approval of both an environmental impact statement and mining approval for a copper and gold mine. And it's interesting for two reasons. Firstly, is it looks at the matters that the minister should have considered in approving the EIS and the mining permit. And it said that the minister had an obligation to actually take into account the climate impacts, but not because there was an explicit requirement to do so in the law. What the court did is it said, okay, so we have the Environment Act, that's the operative law, but that was passed after the government signed the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change and after the government became treaty to the Kyoto Protocol. So when the legislature passed the environment law, it was influenced 
by these treaties and treaty obligations. And secondly, it said that PNG, as a sensible and responsible climate, a global citizen rather, had an obligation to take into account the adverse impacts of climate change when considering environmental impacts. So let me just move on quickly to the, um, this right of participation because it's interesting. Um, the court said that there was a breach of natural justice because of the failure to undertake meaningful consultation with community members. And it's a rare decision in the sense that the court looks at what meaningful consultation should look like. And it said, you know, we need to be talking to community members in a language that they understand, and we need to give them adequate time to consider the impacts. And I think if we're going to think about participation, uh, we don't need slides, I think we can finish slides. Uh, if we're thinking about participation, it is likely to come up in these in infrastructure projects and looking at EISs. And I've yet to see a judgment considering who has the right to participate. It's usually that there might be a right to participate. And climate change impacts women, children, elders and indigenous people and future generations disproportionately. So let me leave you with this thought. Justice will only be fair if it considers diverse perspectives and rights. So perhaps the next generation of litigation looking at procedural rights will start asking this question about who has the right to participate in these decision-making processes. So thank you so much. That concludes our presentation. Thank you very much, Marioni and Cecile, uh, and many thanks to the speakers for their insightful presentations. We've learned so much, and unfortunately, uh, our time has advanced, uh, even though I would have loved to continue discussing further uh, many of the interesting legal points that you have all raised. So uh, our suggestion is to leave the Q&A uh, session, uh, the Q&A time for, for after, this, uh, after the, the event, so that we can move on to the next panel. Um, and to turn to the eminent judges that are with us today um, to hear from them about how um, they use creatively um, uh, traditional and novel legal tools in order to address the legal issues arising from climate change. Um, and also, uh, we are very fortunate to have uh, representatives from um, the Beauty Conscious Operations. We would very much like to hear from them what are the challenges in the national legal systems that they face. So let me first welcome the Right Honourable Lord Carnworth, uh, who was a member of the UK Supreme Court from 2012 to 2020. Throughout his eminent professional career, Lord Carnworth has taken a special interest in environmental law and has handed down many legal uh, leading judgments uh, on environmental issues. Um, then we will turn to, um, um, to the Honourable Justice Beybut Sher Mohamedov, uh, from the Supreme Court of Kazakhstan. Uh, he will kindly tell us more about his environmental uh, practice and, and some interesting recent uh, case law. Uh, at the end of this session, um, we will welcome the, on, uh, the um, Honorable Justice Gana Vronska, who has been a member of the Supreme Court of Ukraine since 2017. Uh, before uh, becoming a judge, Mrs. Vronska was a deputy minister on European integration at the Ministry of Ecology and Natural Resources of Ukraine. So um, I'm very honored uh, to moderate this panel and I will turn now uh, to the uh, Right Honorable Lord Carnworth. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I hope you can hear me. Uh, I'm sorry I was a little late. I had some problems with my getting onto Zoom, but happily my wife's laptop came to the rescue. So here I am. Uh, it's a great honor to take part in this, this discussion. Um, I'm slightly under false pretenses in the sense that I've retired from our Supreme Court last year. So I'm no longer facing directly the challenges that other judges are having to face, but I'm happy to talk on that subject. Um, I've really got, I think, five points to make. Um, the first, I think the most important, is that climate changes aren't a special category. Basically, they're like any other cases that come before a judge. They have to be decided 
uh, impartially on the law and that of the relevant country or jurisdiction and on the evidence that is before the court. And that is, of course, fundamental to the role of judge, whatever case they're dealing with. And of course, implicit in that is that everyone is entitled to justice according to the law, be they climate activists or NGOs or uh, international oil companies. So the second point is really linked to that is the is the question of impartiality. Um, now, it's quite difficult for those of us who've been active in this field for some years, as I have, and have been attending conferences around the world, have been speaking about the importance of the law being effective in respect of climate change. It's easier for us to sort of forget that we have a sort of distinct role as judges, which requires to be done independent and impartially. Um, a, a good illustration of, of that was, in fact, the Norwegian case last year um, on the question of exploration for oil uh, in the um, North Sea in Antarctic. And um, there, one of the um, experienced judges of the Supreme Court, who's very well known to some of us here, um, was required to accuse herself because it was thought that she had been uh, involved too closely with some bodies, some conferences on environmental and climate change law, uh, which and had been at least apparently uh, really involved with the declarations made at those times. Now, personally, I find that quite a harsh decision and I don't think the same view would have been taken in our courts, but nonetheless, I, of course, respect the Norwegian approach, but it does show how careful we all have to be not to be seen to be in any way um, prejudiced by even such a cause as essential to humanity as climate change. But then the third and perhaps um, most difficult challenge is establishing the appropriate legal framework for dealing with these cases. The Paris Agreement, which is in a sense now the foundation of much of our litigation, um, is in some ways unusual because it's an international treaty, which one would expect to see enforced at an international level. But in practice, it depends on national measures to implement the commitments made by the various countries under that agreement. Now, those national measures may be reflected in specialized national legislation. And that's what we have here in the United Kingdom. We have the Climate Change Act of 2008, which is a very strong, to my mind, an effective framework for holding the government to account um, on its climate change commitments with the supervision and advice of a specialized and independent climate change committee. And although cases may go to the courts and some have, on the whole, the, the statutory machinery has been very effective. But of course, where you don't have that sort of statutory framework, then the judges have to look and the litigants have to look to other means. Um, and the earlier speakers have described some of the cases. Um, the Dutch court seemed to be rather ahead of the field, first with the agenda case um, some six years ago, which used the Europe, which used eventually the European Court Convention of Human Rights as a frame, a legal framework for the action. And that's an issue which will be considered by the European Court of Human Rights in due course. And then the most recently, the case against Shell, which um, involved what seemed to be quite a novel interpretation of Dutch tort law. But um, in other countries, one's had a difference in the constitution. The German case, which was mentioned by Christina Voigt, was using the German constitution, the in Pakistan, 
um, mentioned the, the great Ligari case six years ago, which was very much based on the right to life under the constitution. So one needs a legal peg to hang the case on, but the courts have got to be very careful not to stretch the law beyond its natural extension. One has to remember that all these laws are designed broadly, they're not specifically dedicated in those cases to climate change. And so one's got to be very careful to respect the limitations of the legal framework in which one is acting. One can, of course, take uh, help from other jurisdictions of which have similar legal systems. So one sees sort of cross-fertilization between common law countries which share systems based on our own um, laws in this country, and of course civil law systems which go back to the Napoleonic Code and so on. So there is room for cross-fertilization, but one's got to be very careful to keep within the proper limits. Um, then a fourth is, I suppose, the possibility of having to deal with difficult scientific evidence. Um, now, I don't, in fact, regard that as a particular challenge in these cases because judges are used to dealing with difficult scientific evidence in other forms of cases, and it's something one has to work with. And in fact, in climate change cases, one has great advantages of very well respected uh, international guidance and to some to a general extent a consensus as to the science. Um, so that is something which has to be dealt with. But in most of the cases we've seen, it doesn't seem to be the critical aspect. I mean, it's notable, for example, that in the Juliana case in the United States, um, even when during the Trump administration, when um, it might have been thought that some attempt would be made to challenge the climate science, that didn't happen. And it turned entirely on legal issues and the appropriate role of the courts. And then the last point, which is difficult, is the question of enforcement. Because it's one thing to make an order telling the government or Shell or whoever it may be that they've got to. Um, improve their performance, produce a proper program of work to bring down climate and carbon emissions. It's another thing to enforce it um, because courts are used to making orders which have immediate effect and then leaving others to enforce them. Um, now, in the Leghari case in Pakistan, um, Judge Mansour Ali Shah, who may be listing and has been mentioned already a number of times, um, devised a, a remarkable, to me, form of order, which effectively created a novel climate change committee, which overseen by the court, which then implemented or made sure that the government implemented its own climate change policies. And as I understand it, that was very effective indeed. But uh, I don't think that's a mechanism which is necessarily open to other jurisdictions, certainly, I think it would be very novel in our own country. On the other hand, we can make sort of orders which at least achieve something. We had a case in the Supreme Court about air pollution brought by cloud earth, where we decided the government had not done enough to um, implement the European directives on air quality. And we made an order directing it to produce a new plan. And we then um, remitted that to the lower court to oversee what was going on and giving the right for Cloud Earth to come back to the court if it was not satisfied that the future plans were effective. And that is indeed what happened. So there are ways that different systems will devise within their own legal frameworks to ensure that their orders are effective. So that really completes my short remarks. Um, the important thing, as I say, is what I said at the beginning, is that there's nothing particularly special about climate change cases. They obviously have their own challenges, but then so do all the cases which come before the courts, and they needed to be treated with the same degree of objectivity, impartiality, and skill. So thank you all very much for listening.
Thank you very much, Lord Cornwall, for your insightful presentation. Um, and uh, I, I particularly like the point you made about um, the cross fertilization between legal systems uh, in, in the way climate change disputes are being addressed and how traditional and, and novel uh, legal tools are, are, are used in, in different jurisdictions across common law, but also civil law. And just to your point about air pollution, there was an interesting case also in the Bulgarian Supreme Court over the summer uh, that very much um, uh, also ruled uh, in favor of the plaintiff against the municipality for not uh, adopting ambitious climate uh, programs. So um, we would now really, uh, after your presentation, will be very interesting to hear from uh, judges from the civil law uh, tradition, from you know civil law practice. So with this, I will turn to the um, Honorable Justice Beibul uh, Sher Mohamedov. Uh, from the Supreme Court of Kazakhstan. Welcome and uh, look forward to your uh, uh, insightful input into the uh, discussion today. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, good afternoon. I'm very grateful to have the opportunity to share news from Kazakhstan. Until recently, until recently, there were three types of legal proceedings in Kazakhstan. Criminal, civil, and administrative. In the latter case, cases of administrative offenses were considered. In the field of criminal proceedings, there are practically no changes. Uh, except, uh, except for the effort, uh, efforts of criminal responsibility for crimes in the environmental field, primarily those related to poaching. Thus, a rule appeared on the responsibility for an attempt of life and health of environmental workers. Previously, these crimes were exclusively in the chapter of criminal court on crimes against the person. Uh, in the field of civil relations, a new environmental court has been adopted. Uh, in it, the emphasis of compensation for damage to the environment is shifted from the use of natural resources to pollution. This means increased civil liability. And basically, uh, under the definition of the pollution causes, yeah, particularly difficult in the environment of disputes, meaning the dependence. There are difficulties in the disclosure of concepts containing specific terms such as water quality, air quality. And the other difficulty is to define the ratio of uh, to define the ratio of maximum permissible concentration of harmful substances and maximum permissible, uh, permissible emissions of harmful, uh, harmful substances in the time and space. For example, take a one-time emission of harmful substances to the atmosphere with excessive amounts of maximum permissible concentration. And there is a question, will be a violation of environmental legislation if the annual limit is not exceeded? If the, if the annual limit is not exceeded. But the main highlights happened in what I was talking about during the last years.
is the adoption of administrative procedures. It introduces a new type of legal procedure. Purely administrative. What is the story? I give the floor to my colleague German Nurbaev, and he will tell you about. Во-первых, хочу всех поприветствовать участники данного вебинара, пожелать всем плодотворной работы. Меня сейчас представили именно с точки зрения ведения нового института административной юстиции в Казахстане. Это с 1 июля у нас вступил новый закон этого года, административно-процедурно-процессуальный кодекс а также указом президента от 26 января 2021 года были созданы специализированные межрайонные административные суды по всему Казахстану. Только в качестве первой инстанции это по административным делам суды 21 суд по всем регионам, в том числе численная штатность, численная штатность 179 судей в первой инстанции, плюс в Верховном суде, областных судах образованы судебные коллеги по административным делам. Я являюсь именно судьей и членом судебной коллегии по административным делам Верховного суда. В данном случае. Ну, хотел сказать пару слов о том, насколько это для нас революционно, для Казахстана. Этот закон направлен на именно защиту прав как граждан, так и бизнесменов и бизнеса в целом. Но я сокращенно скажу, вот данный кодекс административно-процедурно-процессуальный устанавливает принципы и правила осуществления административных процедур и судопроизводства в сфере публичных правоотношений. Одним из важнейших принципов является принцип приоритета права, означающий, что все сомнения, противоречия, неясности законодательства административных процедур толкуются в пользу участника административной процедуры, то бишь в пользу ИСА. Как правило, это все иски, связанные против государственных органов, если так в двух словах сказать. Принцип Первый принцип, главный, один из главных принципов, это принцип запрета злоупотребления формальными требованиями. Когда административному органу, должностному лицу запрещается отказывать в реализации, ограничивать, прекращать право участника административной процедуры, а также возлагать на него обязанность с целью соблюдения требований, не установленных законодательством нашей страны. Центральным принципом административного судопроизводства при рассмотрении публичных правовых споров является принцип активной роли суда, чего у нас раньше не было, вот, в силу которого законодательство закрепленного права суда не ограничится представленными сторонами доказательствами, а исследовать все обстоятельства, имеющие значение для правильного разрешения дела. Более того, суд вправе высказать свое предварительное мнение по правовым обоснованиям, относясь к фактическим, и юридическим сторонам административных дел. Также активная роль суда заключается в принятии мер к примирению сторон. Если ранее примирение с органами власти было запрещено по законодательству Казахстана, то с внедрением данного кодекса в Казахстане примирение приветствуется. Следует отметить еще принцип презумпции виновности государственных органов которые при соблюдении этого принципа обязаны доказать правомерность своих действий и законность принятых решений. То есть бремя доказанных по делу возлагается на ответчика в административном процессе. Принцип обязательности судебных актов обеспечится введение судебного контроля путем наложения денежного взыскания, в том числе за неисполнение решения суда. При этом денежное взыскание 
может накладываться неоднократно, тем самым установлен непосредственно судебный контроль за исполнением решения суда. То есть раньше этого тоже не было, поскольку судья выносил решение, а исполнением занимались другие органы. Но в данном случае у нас возлагается есть право контроля судебного за судью своего решения исполнения. Ну, также с введением в действии данного кодекса дела по искам физических и юридических лиц об оспаривании действий, бездействия и решения госорганов и должностных лиц, в том числе в сфере окружающей среды, подсудный специализированным межрайонным административным судам Республики Казахстан. По состоянию на 1 октября 2021 года, то бишь ну, за три месяца с 1 июля, со дня введения в действие, специализированные межрайонные административные суды поступило именно в вопросах охраны окружающей среды 50 исков в сфере охраны. Да. О признании незаконным общественных слушаний, ну, вот такие виды иски, исков, о признании недействительным предписание уполномоченного органа в сфере экологического контроля об устранении нарушения экологического законодательства, о признании незаконным отказов предоставления информации и другие. Благодарю за внимание. Спасибо большое. And in conclusion, I want to say that I hope that the issues of building constructions such as uh, nu nuclear power plants, new plants and factories, or resorts like a well-known Kogzhelyau, which may have a negative impact on the environment, will not be accepted without a preliminary discussion with the, with the public. And that is, this law will restrict broad powers of state bodies and officials. And the public will have great access to justice and environmental issues. Thank you very much for your attention. There was a question about uh, the environmental code, so many thanks for addressing this um, and, and for providing uh, such, such a broader and interesting overview of the recent legal uh, developments in Kazakhstan in relation to environmental and climate change. Um, I will turn now um, to the Honorable Justice Gana Vronska for her presentation. So, um, Justice Vronska, the floor is yours. Uh, good afternoon. Could you see my presentation? I am trying to share it yes. on my screen. Yes? Okay, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Ganna Vronska. I'm Justice of the Supreme Court of Ukraine. Before electing as a Justice, I was a Deputy Minister to the Ministry of Environment, and I was co-head of Ukrainian delegation to Paris Summit. So I also, as the thousands of people all over the world, has, uh, have a deep concern about climate change how it rapidly affects our lives. Mm -hmm. So I am very grateful to YBRD and ADB for organizing this seminar and webinar, sorry, webinar, because it's very, I believe it, very, it, it will be very useful for judges and for any other people who are watching us. So I'll start my presentation. I cannot move it. Uh, about a few words about Ukraine. Ukraine, Ukraine is the largest uh, country in Eastern Europe. We have population over 41 million. And this year we celebrating the 30th anniversary of our independence. Ukraine is a party to UN Convention on Climate Change. We ratified it in 1996. And also Ukraine is the party to Paris Agreement. Of course, we ratified it in July. Uh, 2000, 2016. As of today, we don't have any, any obvious climate change case in our courts, but I agree with previous speakers that actually any environmental case can be treated as climate change case. But um, we also don't have any specific climate change leg legislation in Ukraine. 
But we have a, very, a few very important articles in our constitution. The first one is Article 16. It provides that the duty of the state is to ensure ecological safety and to maintain the ecological balance on the whole territory of our country. The other article, which is also very important and is the basic article to protect any um, environmental right in our courts is Article 15. It states that everyone has the right to an environment that is safe for life and health. Also, we have Article 41 and Article 66, which are also very important when somebody is bringing claim to the court, trying to protect its environmental rights. As I said, we don't have any specific climate uh, climate change uh, legislation. Therefore, the courts uh, could play a crucial role in defending people's right to safe environment. And I believe in the future to protect any, uh, to, to consider any climate change cases. Uh, one of the most important cases in our practice on the level of the Supreme Court was so-called Dolphin case. In this case, uh, a plaintiff, which is Ukrainian NGO, ecological NGO, uh, brought a suit against the defendant, stating that it carried out activity on dolphin on dolphinariums without a specific um, permit. And the Supreme Court, in this case, states that any any NGO could bring a claim to the court defending. Environmental, environmental rights of every individual in our country. Uh, exactly the stating was, the wording was that the right to protect the violated constitutional right to a safe environment belongs to every man and can be exercised by a citizen or jointly through an association of citizens. It was the first case when the court and even the Supreme Court of Ukraine actually implemented the, the provisions of Orhos Convention. And uh, despite the fact the Orhos Convention was ratified and is a part of Ukrainian legislation, this is, was the first time when the, when the court applied directly the provisions of this international treaty, international convention. The other case is so-called pigeon case, is also very important. And the Supreme Court again confirms that the Supreme Court agrees with the applicant uh, argument that the courts of lower of lower level uh, applied a limited a limited interpretation of the current legislation to which the Orhos Convention is a part, ignoring that the right to protect of the violated constitutional right to a safe environment belongs by each person. Again, it's we can say that it's a court practice that we that the lower court should implement Orhos Convention and allowing to you to the court, not only by individually, by, uh, by separate persons, but by NGOs or organizations. It, it makes it more easier for people to defend their environmental rights. And as I said before, maybe in the future, we shall have climate case, case climate change cases in our course, courts, even especially based on provisions of Orhos Convention. And the other case also, all of these cases are partially by uh, protecting biodiversity in our country. I am not telling in details about what, what was the position of all parties, but the main, uh, uh, but the main wordings of the Supreme Court again is that considering the importance of environmental protection, a limited interpretation of current Ukrainian legislation the right to protection of the violated constitutional right to a safe environment belongs to everyone and can be exercised by citizens or jointly or throughout the, uh, through an association of citizens. Um, this is my short presentation. I think that Ukraine just in the beginning of the long way of protecting people's rights for safe environment, including climate change actions and uh, I also think that the main challenge for judges to consider such cases is to access to access to global information, uh, understanding the proper understanding how to implement international treaties, including climate change convention, convention, Orhus convention, and of course it's. Um, 
uh, we need to share information between ourselves how we could consider these cases. Thank you for your attention and thank you for inviting me to speak in your webinar. Thank you so much, Justice Ronska. Um, thank you for your excellent presentation and your um, remarks at the end and, and introducing us to Ukraine's constitutional provisions on right to um, healthy environment. Um, now we're at uh, our last session three. Um, our, last, our last session will cover judicial tools and resources to address some of the specific challenges in climate, litigated, um, climate related litigation. Um, our first presentation is from the Honorable Justice Brian Preston. He's the Chief Judge of the Land and Environment Court of New South Wales, Australia. And, and specifically, he will introduce us to the uh, International Bar Association's model statute for proceedings challenging government failure to act on climate change. Um, he was part of the expert um, working group for this important resource. So, Angelo? Which is great pleasure that I'm able to present uh, to this uh, seminar on courts and climate change law. I apologize that I'm not able to be there in person or uh, to present live, but uh, I have pre-recorded this uh, presentation. What I'm interested in exploring is how courts can reform their practice and procedure to facilitate climate litigation. Climate litigation challenges conventional court practice and procedure. There is a need to reform courts practices and procedures to firstly, improve access to the courts. Secondly, improve case management and adjudication. Thirdly, uphold human rights and climate laws. And fourthly, facilitate consistency in judicial decision-making. Now, what are the ways in which courts can reform their practice and procedure? Well, the first is to change the court rules. The second would be to issue practice notes or practice directions, or the court could issue new policies. The court can implement new case management practices. And finally, the court can implement new modes of hearing cases. So what are the subjects uh, for reform? I'm going to deal with a number of them, and I'll just go through them. The first is, who can sue or intervene in the proceedings? The second is how to commence and case manage the proceedings. The third, what are the fees and costs associated with the proceedings? The fourth, how to access information? The fifth, what evidence can be provided? And the sixth would be, how is that evidence to be considered? The seventh would be, how is the law to be interpreted? Uh, eighth, what is, uh, how is the law hearing to be conducted? And finally, what remedies can be granted. I'll deal with each of these. Let's start with uh, who can sue. Now the rules of court or civil procedure will uh, say who can bring proceedings and who can't, but these rules can be amended in most jurisdictions. They can be amended to broaden the access to the courts. The IBA model statute uh, for proceedings challenging government failure to act on climate change that's a copy of the book, uh, has a model statute which gives ideas for how courts can change uh, their rules of practice and procedure. They put forward some liberalized rules of standing. One there you'll see on the screen is that any person may bring proceedings to remedy or restrain a breach of the law. This is a uh, law which we have in New South Wales in Australia. But not only uh, people can bring proceedings, that is, they have standing to sue, also third parties may be able to intervene in the proceedings or act as an amicus curiae. And the rules for such intervention or acting as an amicus uh, can be implemented in the court's rules. Again, the IBA model statute gives suggestions as to the wording. Uh, one there I put on the screen is in relation to intervention, and the other is in relation to uh, an amicus. Now, these uh, interventions and uh, amicus are particularly important in climate litigation because it affects so many people other than the parties. The next step is the commencement of the proceedings, and courts should look at the procedure that they have for uh, 
uh, how proceedings are commenced and try to simplify uh, that process. I've given an example of what the Supreme Court of Philippines did uh, with their new writ of nature called a writ of Calacasin. And that is a very simple process for commencing proceedings in the court. But not only should the forms be simple, but they should be available. So the court should make these available on the court website. They should be able to be completed online. And of course, once they're completed, those completed forms should be able to be lodged online, including by uploading any accompanying documents and paying a filing fee. The next thing is how to case manage proceedings. Courts tend to be rather traditional. They case manage proceedings in the way that they have already uh, always done it. But with climate litigation, we need to be creative, come up with new ways of case managing the proceedings. So some of these new ways will be to allow interlocutory applications and documents and evidence to be filed uh, online, uh, that the uh, case management uh, processes uh, and the hearing of interlocutory applications should be by uh, different technological means. For example, audio, that's such a telephone or an audio visual link, or by using remote meeting platforms such as Microsoft Teams or Zoom. It's also important that courts, when they're looking at their rules for a practice and procedure, that they try to interpret those in ways which will be to further the interest of justice. The rules are tools or means. They are not ends in themselves. The end, of course, is the to administer justice. And so the court rules need to be interpreted in ways that will facilitate access to justice. The next is what are the fees and the costs? Of course, filing fees set by courts are able to be waived or they could be deferred. And this is in particularly important for public interest litigation. There are also, also other rules for interlocutory uh, processes or for the final hearing. And there are a variety of ways that courts can overcome the barrier that uh, is posed by the cost rules. Again, I've given reference to the IBA model statute as to how the court can be innovative in setting fees and costs. When it comes to the final costs, the courts can facilitate public interest litigation by cost shifting orders. If a public interest plaintiff is successful, then ordinarily they should get an award of costs. But even if they're unsuccessful, it may be justifiable to not order the unsuccessful plaintiff to pay the successful government defendants costs because the, there has been a public benefit in the public interest litigation. And even in some circumstances, it may be justifiable that an unsuccessful plaintiff actually receive an award of costs because the litigation has upheld some important public interest uh, issue. Of course, litigation is not just about the, the legal claim, you have to prove it. And that requires accessing information and evidence. And so uh, courts need to be innovative about how they can facilitate access to information. Again, the IBA model statute gives ideas about how that can be done before the litigation is brought, during the currency of the litigation, as well as requiring government defendants to provide written reasons for decision to facilitate the court reviewing those decisions. In relation to evidence, the court could appoint an expert to inquire into and report on issues raised in the climate litigation. If the parties call their own experts, there can be direction that those experts jointly confer and provide a report to the court on the areas in which they agree, they disagree, and the reasons for disagreement. The court should also facilitate the admission into evidence of authoritative reports, such as the reports of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and records of government bodies on climate change issues. When it comes to the consideration of the evidence, there should be some rules and presumptions. One is that the reports of authoritative bodies, such as the uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, should be received into evidence and taken as proof unless somebody has leave uh, to 
challenge those findings or conclusions. The court should also undertake a risk assessment uh, in evaluating the evidence. Uh, this is uh, set out in Article 8 of the IBA model statute. And that risk assessment involves uh, looking at the likelihood of a particular threat being realised, the severity of the consequences of the threat if it's realised, and the time at which the threat may be realised. The court should also apply the precautionary principle. And as we know, if the precautionary principle is activated, the evidential burden will shift to the defendant to disprove climate change and its consequences. When it comes to the interpretation of the law, two presumptions uh, should be applied. One has been referred to as the indubia uh, pro natura presumption. And that is in cases of doubt, one gives an interpretation to legal instruments uh, that is most favorable to protecting the environment. Uh, another presumption is that uh, legal instruments should be interpreted to uphold and advance human rights rather than to hinder them. When it comes to the conduct of the hearing, uh, the court again needs to organize and conduct the hearing in ways that will facilitate access to justice. Of course, courts traditionally have people attend in court. The COVID-19 pandemic has uh, jeopardized that and we have to come up with innovative ways to conduct the hearings. They can be through uh, audio links, such as a telephone conference or audio visual link. It can be using remote meeting platforms such as Microsoft Teams or Zoom, or it could be any combination of these modes. And finally, we come to the remedies that can be granted. Again, the court needs to be creative in what can be granted. I give as an example what the court did in Pakistan in the Ligari case, where the court established an ad hoc climate change commission to inquire into a particular issues and report to the court. That allowed the court to craft particular remedies. I again refer to the IBA model statute uh, in Article 18. There are a number of options available as to the remedies that could be granted and courts could beneficially look to those to see what can be done that is appropriate in any particular case. So that brings to, uh, what I want to say to uh, a close. Uh, what is needed, we can see, is that we need reform in order for renewal. So the reforms that I've suggested will enable the courts to reinvigorate access to justice, to reaffirm human rights, and to renew trust and confidence in the justice system. Thank you for your attention. Um, we'll have to send a big thanks to Justice Preston. Um, the IBA statute that Justice Preston mentioned, it's uh, available, but we'll um, include it in the, uh, the packet that we'll send you after this webinar. Uh, next, I am extremely privileged to introduce the Honorable Justice Luke Leverson, um, the president of the Belgian Constitutional Court, and he's also the president of the EU Forum of Judges for the Environment to share um, the work that he does with them. So, um, Justice Leverson, the floor is yours. Thank you, Christina. I think uh, someone has the slides to uh, show this, my, my slides uh, or there. Hopefully, Angelo can put it up. Angelo, do you have them? Yeah. Yeah. Otherwise, I can. If they are not there, I can try to. Um, it's not up yet, Justice Leverson. Let me. Um, hopefully, uh, the team is working on it. Up oh, there, we go. Now being shared. Okay. So th thank you very very much. I would like to share with you. Uh, some experiences with the European Union Forum of Judges for the Environment, because I think it's an example uh, of uh, knowledge uh, sharing. So please, the next slide. So uh, our forum has been created in 2004, established in 2004, let's say as a follow-up of uh, Johannesburg uh, Judicial Global Judicial Symposium held in 2002 uh, by in the framework of UNEP, United Nations Environmental Programme, and uh, in the framework uh, of this uh, UNEP uh, Judicial Programme, 
we have created this uh, European Union uh, Forum of Judges for the Environment. And our aim is in the first place to exchange uh, experiences in the area of training of the judiciary in environmental law, uh, to contribute to a better knowledge uh, of environmental law, to share experiences with environmental case law, and thus to contribute to a more effective enforcement of environmental uh, law. Uh, next slide, please. The membership uh, is open for all judges and courts within the European Union and also the European Economic Area, which is uh, Norway, Iceland, Liechtenstein. Uh, and the only uh, condition is that those judges have a special interest in environmental law. Secondly, judges from states that are applying for the European Union membership can follow activities uh, as uh, uh, observers. And third, we have a third category, associated members. So judges from other countries, uh, which are not European Union countries, can become uh, associated uh, members without uh, geographical uh, restriction. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we are supported uh, by uh, DG Environment uh, of the European Commission, so the, let's say, the government of the European uh, Union, also by the Belgian uh, Environmental uh, Ministry, the Norwegian Ministry of Climate and the Environment, and also by IMPEL. IMPEL, that's the network uh, of uh, environmental inspectors in uh, Europe. And uh, the forum is a member of the European Union Environment Compliance and Governance Forum. It's a forum created by the European Union in which uh, representatives uh, of member states are uh, uh, present, but also uh, representatives of the different networks uh, on environmental law and enforcement we have uh, in, within the European Union. So apart from uh, our forum, also the NP, so the, uh, uh, the Network of Public Prosecutors for the Environment, IMPEL, so the Environmental Inspectors, also Environment Envi Crime Net, which are the police uh, specialized in environmental law and some uh, others. Next slide, uh, please. So uh, our first main activity is organizing uh, uh, annual uh, conferences. So uh, every year we have a conference and let's say we try to find a subject which is of common uh, uh, interest and what is of, of course, within the European Union, uh, something which is common to uh, all uh, judges within the European Union. Uh, that's of course European Union environmental law. And so we uh, we'll, are always trying to find the subject which is at the same time for relevance for the European Union as a whole, but also uh, for the uh, uh, different uh, member states within the European Union. And the idea is to share uh, 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 information and experiences with the application uh, of uh, European environmental law. And we use, let's say, a methodology uh, which uh, is, uh, well known so we are preparing uh, every year a questionnaire to see how a european environmental law on a particular subject is uh, understood applied interpreted in the different member states so national reports uh, are uh, prepared uh, a general report uh, is uh, uh, prepared and then we have presentations by judges from the, Europe, uh, the Court of Justice of the European Union, by the European Commission, but also uh, uh, presentations by uh, national judges on specific uh, specific topics. And here you see the list of uh, items we have uh, discussed uh, in uh, the uh, past. Next slide, uh, please. In 2007, for the first time we had our annual conference on climate change and the judiciary, and has already been uh, indicated by previous speakers. Meanwhile, a lot has been happen happening 
And so uh, in 2017, we had at that moment one iconic case, uh, or maybe two, but uh, the, the main was the Uganda case in the Netherlands. Meanwhile, uh, climate change litigation has uh, developed considerably. And we think that, uh, of course, uh, this will go uh, further. And uh, because in, within the European Union, where we have various important developments, and uh, the first is uh, the, new, uh, the Green Deal, uh, which is proposed uh, by the uh, uh, European uh, Commission. Meanwhile, the European Union Climate Change Act has been updated with more ambitious uh, uh, objectives for 2050 and, uh, and further. And now under discussion is the so-called Fit for 55 program where the, the, the concrete measures uh, are discussed to implement this Europe, this new European Union climate change law. So what we think that the moment is there, maybe for next year, we have to discuss it uh, uh, with uh, our board, that maybe next year our annual conference could be again on climate change uh, and the judiciary. Next slide, uh, please. So here, uh, all the material from all, all our uh, former conferences, you can find uh, on uh, our uh, web, uh, on our website. Uh, next slide, uh, please. We have some other activities. So the forum is participating in the meetings of the task force on access to justice of the artist convention in Geneva. I will not go into that because Marina Janus will present it. Uh, we are involved, uh, as was indicated already, in the Global Judicial Institute on the Environment. And uh, we are also involved in specific training uh, activities. Uh, next slide, uh, please. And a very important uh, program, which is running now for uh, nearly 10 years, uh, I think, within the European Union, and which is sponsored uh, by the European uh, uh, Commission is specific training programs in environmental law for judges uh, in within the European uh, uh, Union. And for the moment, uh, that uh, training program is run by ERA. Uh, it's uh, the Europäische Rechtsakademie in Trier in Germany. And in the past, so different uh, training have been organized uh, and also training packages have been developed and these packages uh, which are especially meant for in the first place judges but also uh, prosecutors can be found uh, uh, through the website of uh, the European uh, uh, Commission. So in the next slide you can uh, find an example of this and you can so go through the links and uh, find the, 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 the concrete training, training mate, uh, material on that particular subject. For example, uh, the protection of environment through criminal law, uh, this one of the training uh, uh, courses and all the material is available uh, on, uh, on the, the website. For the moment, uh, one is uh, developing uh, the, the training program for the next years, and we have proposed uh, to include uh, climate change as one of the uh, next priorities to, to cover in, in those training uh, programs. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, a lot is happening now within the European Union with the new Climate Change Act, with the FIT uh, 455 program, etc. So I think uh, much more attention uh, in training should go uh, to that uh, topic. So this concludes uh, my short uh, presentation on, uh, next slide please, uh, on, on what we are doing uh, with uh, uh, our forum. We have a website, so all the information is uh, uh, available uh, on that uh, web, uh, website. And those who are interested to become member, associated member, uh, and so on, they can also contact us uh, through the uh, website. So thank you uh, very much.
Thank you, Justice Leverson. Thanks for uh, introducing or participating judges to the rich resources that the uh, European uh, Forum for Judges has available and, and also giving us a snapshot of why capacity building is really critical right now. Last but not least, we have the pleasure of having Marina Yanush um, from the UN Economic Commission for, Envir for Europe, um, who will share the Our House Convention, uh, what the Our House Convention Secretary has been um, how they've been supporting the judges, especially in integrating access to justice issues. And um, a few of our um, ADB developing member countries in the Central West region are um, signatories to the Our House Convention. So uh, Marina, I'll hand the floor to you. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much, Christina. Distinguished honorable judge, judges, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm honored to join uh, this virtual meeting today and share with you some insights and some takes uh, from the work undertaken uh, under our species of the Aarhus Convention. Uh, I work for UNSCE, which is one of the United Nations regional commissions uh, that provides a secretariat to the Aarhus Convention. And I hope that my presentation has the key takes uh, made by the distinguished speakers today. On the next slide, uh, you can see that this meeting is very timely. Uh, 2021 is a very special year uh, when both matters, uh, climate action and the Sustainable Development Goal 13 and access to justice for all, Sustainable Development Goal Target 16.3 uh, are at the heart of the discussion of the World uh, Sustainable Development Agenda. Both the Regional Forum on Sustainable Development in the UNSCE region and then Global High-Level Political Forum on Sustainable Development in July provided an opportunity for governments and stakeholders to explore what actions could help to reach out these goals and targets in synergy and overcome existing challenges. Additionally, you might have already heard uh, about other important initiatives launched recently with regard to the global recognition of the right to a healthy environment and establishing of a mandate of the Special Rapporteur on Human Rights and Climate Change at the Human Rights Council, and also uh, about regional recognition of the right to a healthy environment at the Council of Europe. This year is also very special for the Aarhus Convention as it celebrates 20th anniversary since its entry into force. And the upcoming in a week meeting of the parties to the Aarhus Convention will decide on the future work uh, under its framework. And of course, the discussion on the promotion of the human rights based approach on uh, climate governance will further pick be picked up at the uh, UNCCC uh, COP26 in Glasgow afterwards. On the next slide, uh, you can see that uh, the convention sets out international legally binding obligations of the parties and guarantees public rights to information, participation in decision making and access to justice in environmental matters, also relevant in the climate uh, change context. Uh, these rights are indispensable for the overall objective to contribute to the protection of the right of every person of present and future generations to live in an environment adequate to his uh, health and well-being. And the convention, the convention practically supports uh, environmental good governance and human rights nexus. And access to justice as a basic principle of the rule of law constitutes one of the three pillars uh, that uh, mutually reinforce uh, each other. In simple terms, uh, members of the public should have access to review procedures to challenge a refusal or inadequate response to a request for information to challenge the legality of a decision, act, or mission on a specific activity or even a plan or program, or to challenge acts, which can be also in the form of decisions or omissions that, con that contravene a national laws relating to the environment. Each of these uh, cases uh, can be linked to climate matters and if the respective provisions of the conventions are implemented well, 
they can bolster the other two pillars, namely the disclosure of environment related, uh, of climate related environmental information. For example, with regard to information on uh, green, uh, greenhouse gas emissions and inventories and public participation in climate related decision making, for example, with regard to the adoption of climate adaptation and mitigation plans. Consequently, access to justice pillar is a backbone for promoting transparency and, and environmental justice in climate governance. On the next slide, I will try to prove that the convention is a living instrument addressing the current challenge, uh, being able to address the current challenges thanks to its governing and capacity building frameworks. The meeting of the parties to the convention usually decides on the new directions of the work on the basis of the inputs provided by the convention bodies, national implementation reports, and results of capacity building activities provided by partner organizations. The task force on access to justice uh, set out under auspicious of uh, the governance framework is a multi-stakeholder open-ended platform bringing together uh, representatives of the governments, members of judiciary, NGOs, or who centers, intergovernmental organizations, international financial institutions, and academia. Similar to convention itself, the meetings of the task force can be joined by representatives and stakeholders from any interested UN member states. The task force takes stock of the experience by parties, uh, members of judiciary, NGOs, and other stakeholders in implementing these new directions uh, set out by the meeting of the parties and identify key challenges, barriers, uh, and good practices that can lay down uh, ground for the future work. Additionally, in 2017, the meeting of the parties to the Aarhus Convention decided to establish a network of judiciary, ju judicial training institutions, and other review bodies in the pan-European region to support exchange of experience uh, in the implementation of the convention and wider the environmental uh, rule of law. The network usually meets back to back to the task force on access to justice. And this is a humble convention's contribution to the promotion of the judicial cooperation and environmental matters from regional to the global level. But we also see a need for a strong support by partners to promote judicial cooperation at the sub-regional uh, uh, and national levels, as well as cross-regional cooperation, for example, with the ESCAZU agreement or with the Asian Development, uh, uh, Asian Judicial Network. And today's event is a very important example uh, in this regard. It uh, remains important uh, to promote such cooperation because it cannot reach uh, the knowledge uh, using the different languages, the different legal uh, systems, and uh, uh, to learn more about the innovative approaches uh, are uh, uh, implemented by the courts across the world uh, on uh, climate uh, litigation or other or any other emerging matters uh, in this uh, regard. Unfortunately, we still see a gap when capacity building projects at the national level aiming to strengthen justice systems do not necessarily cover environmental matters. For example, is justice initiatives do not always allow information mining in, envir in environmental matters easily, or climate-related projects do not necessarily address matters related to access to justice, for example, supporting uh, awareness of judiciary about the risks posing by climate change or access to technical expertise. And we really look forward to work with all partners that can close uh, this gap. On the next slide, uh, I would like to draw your attention uh, to the forthcoming decision uh, 7-3, which is about to be adopted by the meeting of the parties to the Aarhus Convention. The decision will define the convention's priority for the future work on access to justice for 2022-2025. Uh, with regard to substantive focus, systemic issues, and possible activities to support awareness raising and capacity building. 
Uh, while the convention uh, does not contain a word climate in its text, uh, the parties acknowledged importance of uh, sharing experience regarding climate litigation. And uh, the substantive uh, focus uh, will be considered from several uh, perspectives uh, of the key systemic issues. Uh, for example, from the matter of jurisdiction in a wider sense, because as we was mentioned today, the climate change can be dealt by the constitutional courts, by the Supreme Court, by administrative courts, and uh, it, uh, the unified approach is to the interpretation uh, of uh, the national law, interpretation of the uh, national law in the international co context is very important. Another important issue is standing. Uh, uh, distinguished speakers already mentioned an increasing reliance of claimants on the constitutional law, international law, human rights, and environmental law. And uh, the cases, uh, we see that the cases can be brought uh, in private and public interest. But unfortunately, we also noted an increasing problem with standing in some countries over past years. So, uh, we need to monitor also this uh, trend in this regard, whether this could also pose a challenge and a barrier for the climate litigation. Uh, thirdly, uh, we would need to explore innovative approaches to costs and uh, access to assistance mechanism. Unfortunately, cost was mentioned as a second impo important barrier, which exists now in access to justice in environmental matters. We see that climate uh, cases brought uh, uh, several innovative solutions, like, for example, uh, crowdsourcing campaigns in environmental uh, in uh, climate uh, changes, which is was not known, for example, beforehand. And uh, I think uh, there are also other innovative mechanisms that uh, we could, uh, uh, for example, collect uh, uh, from our community in order to share this experience with the court. Uh, fourthly, uh, it would be necessary to carefully examine whether the shifts in burden of proof is needed and how to reflect it in the legislation. And uh, also, uh, there would be a situation when the courts would increasingly deal not only with the formal sources of information as IPP, uh, IPCC reports that were mentioned, but also with other sources of data and knowledge, for example, uh, derived from crowdsource information, derived from citizen science report. And this is a very new issue that just came up in our forum, and we will continue monitoring these developments. And of course, the next uh, um, important issue is remedies, uh, because the, the courts would need to keep a very fine line in order not to step in in the shoes of administration. But the remedies would need to be effective enough in order to not to uh, allow, let's say, in a simple term, spin pong, when slight modifications in the planned projects or policies are made, but this do not result actually to the effective enforcement of the court decision. And of course, what if the administration decide not to comply with the court decision, as we know from the cases related to air pollution? So the task force will study the results of the successful litigation, climate litigation in different parties to the convention, and also what factors and conditions uh, that were conductive to bring uh, this uh, litigation, uh, this cases to a success and uh, what factors uh, influence uh, uh, the final decision. And on the next slide, uh, I would like to share some key resources uh, like implementation guides, jurisprudence database, and analytical studies developed under auspices of the task force uh, that have information on the application of environmental procedural rights. One lesson learned from, from the work under the convention that changes and new trends are appearing quickly now. And it's important uh, that this information reaches uh, interested members of judiciary quickly. 
So there is a need to continue collection and exchange of information on a continuous basis. And we've heard that there are a lot of databases, which is good because they enrich the knowledge of, uh, of available information. But we see that the bottleneck now might lay at the national level uh, where actually this information is generated. So therefore, this justice initiatives mentioned for improving case management, case law databases, collection of relevant statistics and court proceedings in the countries tailored to environmental matters remain crucially important. And if they are implemented with the support of internationally agreed open standards, it can become easier to disseminate and share such information across the courts in different jurisdiction and uh, uh, support raising awareness and uh, work of judiciary at different jurisdictions at different level because the ca environmental cases can also be and climate change cases can also be increasingly cross jurisdictional and there where this uh, international exchange of information would need to be step up and would need to be of a high uh, quality. And uh, finally, uh, let me warmly thank the organizers for this excellent event and confirm our readiness to continue the collaboration with the Global Judicial Institute on the Environment, with the European Forum of Judges for the Environment, uh, the Asian Development Bank, the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, and all other partner organizations to support the promotion of the rule of law in environmental matters. And of course, we look forward very much to the upcoming chairmanship of uh, Justice uh, Lavrison of the Task Force on Access to Justice. And uh, we remain at your disposal for any support uh, that, that we could uh, provide uh, to uh, uh, in the future to support uh, the judicial cooperation on this matter. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Marina. Thank you for your comprehensive uh, presentation. Very interesting and it's great that there are resources available. Uh, thanks for pointing out to, to these. Um, so with this, our formal uh, part for the presentations has, uh, has, has uh, concluded and I would like to thank all the, all the panelists for their presentations. We have a few uh, minutes left for questions, um, so I cannot resist but ask um, Justice Lavrison a question. And there actually a question that came about what are the, 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 the whether the, the courts and the the, the, the judges have um, the, the skills to adjudicate climate uh, change cases, and I think we have answered that. Um, but after Marina's presentations in particular, uh, it will be very uh, helpful if you can. Tell us a bit more how um, judges um, draw from the international legal principles, international legal agreements um, in order to adjudicate uh, in national courts, uh, especially what is the interplay between international uh, public international law and uh, state law uh, and uh, constitutional law. Is uh, Justice Larison still with us? Vaselina, this is Antonio Benjamin. Can you hear yes. me, Vaselina? Yes, I can hear you, Justice Benjamin. Well, I think this Would is- Would you like very... to take this question? Yes, thank you. Well, I, I, I can't take the, the whole question because I cannot mm -hmm. speak for other parts of the world. But in Latin America, we have to uh, understand that climate change uh, cases come in, in two uh, categories in, in addition to the ones that were already mentioned by the previous speakers. One is what um, uh, I call uh, pure blood uh, climate change cases. And those are the most complex ones, several examples were given here today, but more often the great majority of climate change cases come together with deforestation cases um, and several uh, other more traditional uh, 
uh, um, types of litigation. And the instruments for those types of cases are already present in, in most Latin American countries. Uh, the, the basic environmental law principles, the instruments, uh, and, uh, and so on. So we should not, uh, we should be careful not to uh, scare judges in, in um, with the wrong perception that climate change litigation is completely, uh, it, it's something that's dropping on our uh, courtrooms out of the blue from Mars. No, we, we already have most of the tools and we have the expertise to do it. What we need is awareness, is knowledge, precisely what this type of event is, uh, can provide. Thank you very much, Justice Benjamin. Um, Christina, is there any questions from the audience? Maybe we can ask. Um, there are several questions from the audience. Um, well, actually, a lot of um, questions on law. But I, I had a question. There's a, a question to Professor Voigt. I don't know if she's still on. I think she, she may be. She may have gone, but I, I do have a oh, question. No, she, she is here. She is here with us. Oh, excellent. Excellent. Professor Foy, uh, sorry, I didn't know you were still here. Um, there is a question for you um, about the Dutch Shell case. Um, and, and it says it's coming from a Finnish perspective uh, with the dualistic system of transposing international treaties. Um, so, it, you know, this person is saying, Carrie is saying that, you know, it seems surprising a private company could be made responsible basically on the basis of the Paris Agreement. Um, the Dutch system is to my knowledge, mono, monistic. Uh, so is, that, is there an explanation? Um, and and uh, if time allows, um, Carrie would like to know um, comments on the Norwegian case. Um, absolutely, um, the, the, the Shell case, um, as I tried to explain as well, um, the, the Dutch um, court did not rely on the Paris Agreement and did not apply it directly. Uh, and therefore the question whether it's a monist or dualist uh, legal system did not arise. The, um, the, the court um, in interpreting what the content of the duty of care is relied on eight or 10 different sources of law. Uh, or sources, not necessarily legal sources. It looked at Shell's own policies. It looked at human rights. It looked at OECD guiding principles. It looked at science. It looked at constitutional provisions. It looked at um, uh, environmental principles. And it looked also on the Paris Agreement, but it only used these elements to give uh, content and meaning to the, to the duty of care, but it did not apply an international treaty directly to um, a, a core protector and, and it, it couldn't do so either. I mean, it, it doesn't have anything to do with monist or dualist international law, especially the Paris Agreement does not apply directly to, to private corporate um, actors. But what, it, what was interesting was it looked at the overall normative framework around the, the corporation and how that could influence the understanding of what, what would be the, the duty of care that the company had. Um, well, I'm, 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 I'm happy to provide comments on the Norwegian case. Um, not quite cl clear what, what exactly the, the question is about the case because it raises many different questions or raised many different questions. I have published about it. Um, but it was an interesting, um, unfortunate, but not unexpected outcome that the Norwegian um, uh, Supreme Court rendered in December last year on the legality of new oil exploring licenses. I think it had an opportunity to interpret a, a constitutional provision which establishes clearly a right of every, um, every uh, one to a clean and healthy environment in Norway. Um, that was not um, the subject of any constitutional case before. So it was a new question that the Supreme Court could have uh, addressed, but it only looked at the, um, the duty of the state rather than the content of the right in this particular case. And it found that the, um, the parliament by having 
um, uh, put in place climate mitigation uh, measures had done enough uh, in terms of climate mitigation and it was therefore not violating um, any duty to address climate change when it um, uh, uh, when it uh, confirmed or approved these these oil exploring licenses but as I said it was an opportunity lost and uh, it was a very interesting uh, finding, uh, which disappointed many, of course, but it wasn't quite unexpected. But maybe um, what is not so well known is that the continuation of this case is now has now come to the European Court on Human Rights, where the European Court of Human Rights is asked to look at whether the European Convention on Human Rights was violated by the um, uh, issuing of these oil exploration licenses. Thanks, Professor Boyd. So with that, uh, we're, we come to the end of our webinar and uh, we're going to hand the floor to you, Justice Benjamin, to make our concluding remarks. Well, many thanks to, uh, to the two uh, colleagues that were really uh, behind this, this event and the two teams, the extraordinary teams uh, of the Asian Development Bank, uh, Christina Pack, uh, and on the side of the European uh, Bank for Reconstruction uh, and Development, um, my now new friend, Vaselina. Um, we had so many meetings. Um, many thanks to the European Forum of Judges uh, for the Environment and all the speakers and participants that were together uh, with, with us. Uh, as I was telling uh, Christina Pack, in, in exchanging a message, uh, this is a, 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 an incredible event, uh, not just because of the nature of the theme, um, the level of the, 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 the presentations, uh, the combination of academics, uh, judges, and, uh, and, the and the financial institutions. My last word is really on development. Uh, development banks, uh, they have the duty to work for development and development as it happened in the 70s with the World Bank and the Inter-American Bank when they incorporated the environment in the early 70s, much before many countries had any environmental um, le specific legislation. Uh, now climate change is part of this portfolio. And we cannot talk about development and uh, ecologically sustainable development without putting climate change at the forefront. So I congratulate the two institutions and the, I repeat the fantastic team that, that you have. I wish I had the time to name each one of them. I see here, for example, Brioni, uh, Maria Cecilia and others. So many thanks uh, to, um, to all of you. To our participants, especially the judges, Professor Christina Voigt um, will, would probably uh, make the announcement, but since she didn't, uh, the World Commission on Environmental Law, and she can compliment, is organizing a judicial environmental uh, law conference within the context of the second IUCN World Environmental Law Congress uh, to be held in Rio de Janeiro on December 8, 9, and 10. So perhaps, Christina, you could say a few words about that, and then we end. Thank you, Antonio, and thank you for reminding me. Um, the World Commission on Environmental Law throughout the entire year has organized what we call the Second World Environmental Law Congress, which consisted of very uh, um, various different uh, events um, prior to the IUCN World Conservation Congress, which was just in the beginning of last month in Marseille, and we will continue throughout the autumn. And one of the uh, events still to come is the um, judicial event in Rio that Justice Antonio Benjamin just mentioned, and we'll follow up with uh, two more events, one in Singapore and one in uh, France and Paris. In Singapore, we'll be focusing on uh, the biodiversity convention and the current negotiation on the post-2020 
biodiversity framework and the, the date is not yet set entirely, probably the 1st of December. And the final event in France will be focusing on environmental legal indicators and how to measure the effectiveness of environmental law. And that's probably also a very important aspect uh, for judges um, to use in their deliberations. And that will be in the 17th and 16th of December in France. Well, many thanks. On this note, I wonder, uh, Christina and Vaseline, if we can close our event. Would you like to <laughs> yes. say anything in addition to this? Um, just really th thanks to all the justices and judges for tuning in around the world and for everyone to hang, um, you know, to hang on till, till the very end. And obviously to all our excellent presenters and speakers, thank you for your valuable time. And uh, we really look forward to working with uh, BBRD um, Judicial Institute of uh, Judges and, and also the EU Forum for uh, Envir um, Judges for the Environment and uh, IUC and WCEL. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. Thank, Vaselina, thank you. Please. Thank you, Justice Benjamin. Uh, once again, thank you to all the, the panelists. Uh, we learned so much today. It was really um, uh, a kind of a display of different perspectives, experiences, uh, lessons learned, but also um, uh, interesting trends that are coming up in climate litigation and challenges for some of our uh, judges and, and countries of operation. So I think from the part, from the, from the, on behalf of the EBRD, I would like to um, confirm that, you know, we look forward to um, exploring further collaboration with our partners today. Um, there was uh, enormous support for this webinar and interest also we've seen in the in the chat function. So we hope that an event like that and the others also mentioned by Justice Benjamin will help um, uh, create these communities of judges and legal professionals um, across jurisdictions because, you know, one of the key principles we mentioned independence um, uh, of the judges and, and, and also their, their particular role in the society, I think it could be accomplished uh, easily also through uh, cross fertilization, uh, sharing of information and, and knowledge. So uh, many thanks once again and look forward to our next initiative together. Well, many thanks and this concludes our uh, day evening uh, in many parts of the, uh, of the world. And I hope to see you all in the near future. Uh, our hosts are putting a slide uh, with the, the different um, links. So many thanks and goodbye.